Thank you for being here. Uh, I am Arun Srinivasan, health scientist with CDC's National Center for Chronic Diseases Prevention and Health Promotion. And uh, that's a long one. I uh, always try to make sure I say it right. Um, and today I'm joined by Rishi Tarar, enterprise architect with Northrop Grumman and uh, uh, consultant to CDC. Uh, we have other co-contributors to this uh, work. Uh, John, Dr. John Lunsk is in the audience here, uh, working with CGI Federal and also consultant to CDC. Marcelo, um, where are you? Here your hand, yeah. Uh, uh, architect with Northrop. And uh, Kirsten Hagman, who is with uh, Cerner Corporation. So our title is to subscribe or hook for CDS. So you'll be hearing us uh, from us our experiences from implementing a decision support services for public health use case. So I want to go give a brief introduction to the pro problem space and uh, the background of the work and then hand it over to Rishi to go over the technical details of the implementation. So uh, we call it the reporting design pattern. So public health depends on clinical care and lab to send data to CDC. Uh, it is how we respond to plan and respond to events, and data is pretty critical, and uh, the essential, uh, essential completeness and timeliness of the data to help us uh, plan our actions. But the challenge, or the, the, the way we see this as a fire has evolved over the period of time, um, we, we understand the impact of having restful queries and uh, the whole concept of apps and how the useful of it, but we see that most of these events that, of, that are of interest to public health, which happens within the clinical space, is actually totally abstracted from the external um, organization, like a public health entity. We do not know what these events are, so it's, it's it, the kind of expecting this query-based approach to work for us is a huge challenge, because unless we know who the patients are, unless we know that the event did happen, making those queries are, are a challenging uh, prospect. So uh, with a huge emphasis on query being happening in many of the approaches that you have heard in the last couple of days, um, um, we see like, you know, public health who fits in this external organization category. And typically, there is a business associate handling all these data transactions between healthcare, which is more of a clinical uh, business associate. Ex expecting that query model to work across these multiple stages is a huge challenge. Uh, what public health would largely benefit or anticipate to work for us is more of an unsolicited push, which, which means like once an event happens, that can trigger, that e the trigger event needs to make a further communication downstream to public health. But then probably a query model can come back to help to get additional data collection and things like that. With the way current things exist, clinical care organizations, we all know in this group, I believe everybody accepts that, there's huge challenge to actually uh, go in from an external entity to go into clinical care and fish around for data. It's, a, it's pretty complex, and I don't see uh, how things would change in the near future around this space. So there are some uh, real challenges there. So a little deeper looking into what, does, what do we mean by reporting design? Uh, we call it the design elements of a reporting design. The, the, if you look at these topic areas, which is knowledge distribution, triggering, uh, application of inclusion exclusion rules, um, need for unsolicited push or supplemental data acquisition, these are elements that can, are not just applicable just to public health. It applies for population health data extraction, applies for research, uh, uh, um, um, uh, research studies too. We are, it is applicable to registries, clinical registries, or external specialized registries to identify data for this. All these defined design elements are pretty applicable to that space as well. So when, when we look at how it applies to one specific use case, which is the stroke use case, uh, Paul C. Coverdell, Paul Coverdell Acute Stroke Registry Program, uh, it's since, it has been active since 2004. It is interested in collecting data from the onset of a stroke, stroke event to post-discharge care. So the data that's been collected uh, through these different systems are essential to support some of the intervention planning and care coordination activities. So all these data are, 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 are reported to a specialized registry called as the uh, Coverdell Stroke Registry. Currently, nine grantee states have it active functioning too. So um, the reporting needs to happen from each of these different systems. Expecting a, a registry to make this call to, in, to these individual systems is a huge challenge, and expecting that to happen across different organizations because the, uh, the, the patient could be in an emergency department in one hospital, can be moved to another hospital, which could be in a different system. Making this query across is a huge challenge. So when we wanted to look at uh, 
taking a small piece of this puzzle and try to see how, it, how this reporting workflow flow will happen. We looked at uh, patients, uh, non-pediatric patients, who had an onset, who had a stroke event that has happened outside the hospital setting. And we were interested to see uh, if the primary diagnosis or the primary reason for admission is stroke. We were interested to follow up those patients to collect additional data sets. So this was our fundamental use case for this particular work. We wanted to identify those patients. We want to have a decision support service to identify that patient and report that patient out to log that patient out to a registry who can be then further followed up for additional data use collection. So that's kind of the use case. And I want to hand it over to Rishi, who is going to walk us through how we tackle this problem. So thank you. Hello, my name is Rishi. All right, like Arun talked about the use case, let's talk about what is the kitchen sink that's available within the CDS landscape. Um, so there are quite a few, you know, recognizable things over there on the screen. Um, so I'm going to jump right next to it. So if you look at the process, like on public health side, uh, you know, you have various different steps. But, you know, if we try to simplify and not oversimplify, I guess, there is a triggering mechanism that is needed. There is an execution. Where does the execution happen that's needed? And then how does the logic get delivered? So uh, on the triggering side, we looked at hooks and subscriptions. Execution side, you know, I think Arun kind of mentioned some, something about the business associate, and, and that's kind of like a remote execution or not remote execution. Um, and then logic delivery around CQL ELM libraries uh, versus the, the fire plan definition resource. So, you know, looking at that kitchen sink and kind of organizing them into our steps, uh, we looked at there are many options that exist, and we are also noticed that clinical care standards and feasibility of these implementations are evolving. Uh, so we thought that, well, let's do some experimentation. So uh, going back to what Arun described, uh, this is kind of like a logic. Um, it looks very similar to other logics that you might see. Uh, it's uh, you know inclusion, exclusion criteria, and things like that. But the but the outcome is always those uh, you know green and red circles, which is from a public health standpoint, this is a case or event of interest that's green, um, and then if no action needs to be taken. Uh, then that's red. So. Uh, so we implemented, we are trying to implement this logic in many, many different ways. So here's another example of the architecture uh, of using the <coughs> CQL engine, and shout out to Bryn Rhodes. Um, so in this scenario, what we decided that, okay, we're going to try out subscriptions uh, in order to be able to trigger uh, an event from a fire server or from the clinical side. And the CDS service will, it, the, the push that you see on the screen is basically a post uh, that goes uh, to the CDS service. And the CDS service could be a custom service, could be uh, you know, a CQL engine, or it could be anything. But we went with the CQL engine uh, based off of the CQF ruler project. And then eventually, uh, you know, when the criteria was met, inclusion criteria was met, uh, you know, we logged yeah, this patient is of interest, uh, it needs to be added to the registry. So in this scenario, you see there is a gray area where, you know, this is where it could be a business associate, it could be on the clinical side, uh, it may not be on the public health side. So, so th those, those uh, you know, business architectures need to evolve over time. Uh, this is another view into the same, uh, you know, use case, but using plan definition. Um, in this case, the remote CDS service is nothing but a coordinator. Uh, eventually, uh, when plan definition is implemented appropriately, uh, you know, across implementations, everything could become self-contained where plan definition is applied um, and the trigger is mapped in and then it should automatically work. Um, and then uh, use of CDS hooks uh, using a remote SQL engine. And you have seen many numerous examples of that you know, across these presentations. Uh, but here in this case, hook usually uh, you know, creates a workflow event and then you know, uh, put, uh, does a post to the CDS service. CDS service does its magic. So if you look at these three examples, some patterns emerged. Uh, one thing that we noticed was, uh, you know, subscription triggering is very data-oriented. 
that means you know you can you know, it's it's based on the data actually elements and the values of that data. Uh, the other part was the scope of a triggering is within patient context. In our case, we are interested in the population context. Um, uh, and then in case of CDS hooks, it's very workflow oriented. And again, the scope is within the patient context. Uh, the remote uh, execution uh, poses its own challenges, legal policy implications emerge like you know, we alluded to the business associates of clinical care. Uh, there are quite a few examples out there. Um, and then there's a uh, non-remote execution where, you know, again, we are dependent on the fire uh, implementations within the vendor's landscape. Uh, what we noticed uh, during our time here, shout out to Bryn, uh, um, is uh, that, that we, we kind of uh, understand that the plan definition packages the implementation details very, very transparently. Um, so in our experience, uh, you know, subscription triggering is the appropriate choice. Variation in implementation across servers exists, and that's the reality. Um, again, for plan definition, same thing uh, applies. Uh, we based our CDS service based on the CQF for all, a ruler, um, thanks to Bryn again. Um, and then supply chain and delivery of knowledge, those are issues, uh, you know, not issues, but I think that landscape is... Uh, uh, you know, evolving uh, with a notable mention to CDS Connect, um, you know, from EHRQ, which is trying to create a repository. Uh, and the next steps. So in our case, uh, we, would l we would stress on the consistency of subscriptions across implementations. And then uh, based on what we learned in the last two days around plan definition, and we kind of charted out uh, how it's going to work, would be uh, you know, using activity definition within a plan definition and defining a task. And within that task, when we execute that task, a reporting uh, you know, uh, event goes out um, as per the spec defined within the, within the plan definition. And that's about it. So uh, in case of CDS hooks, uh, it's very, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, workflow oriented. So workflow could be someone opened a patient chart, right? And so in case of public health, we are interested in, okay, uh, is, was there a patient that just was entered an ICD-10 code, ICD code for an observation? That's data oriented. So that's the difference between the two. And then the other part is, uh, uh, you know, uh, subscription kind of just works in the back end. It just it just does its thing. So, any other questions? All right. That's a good question. So um, I think uh, there was a subscription track. Oh yes. Uh, so the question was, uh, where is the EHR community with subscriptions? Um, so as far as I know, or I'm aware, uh, you know, there was a track at HL7 Connectathons for the last uh, year and a half since 2017 uh, for subscriptions, um, and uh, you know, there, I think there is some support for subscriptions uh, in some of the popular EHRs. Uh, but look for the next September Connectathon, and I think there's going to be a subscription track, um, and which is getting active. And in fact, uh, we noticed that uh, every vendor that we talked to, EHR vendor we talked to here in this event, um, you know, they are seeing a lot of use cases around subscription. So there is definitely traction around that. The source you're subscribing to, it depends on the criteria query uh, of the subscription spec. So it's nothing but a fire search query uh, that is defined as a, as a criteria when you register a subscription. Where's the, where's the knowledge that it, that's being stored? 
where's the, no so yeah. So a subscription can actually work with the value set or terminology. So you could say where observation code in value set, and, and you, know, you can make complex uh, you know, criteria around that. So in this use case, our subscription was towards any patient who was discharged and the patient was alive. So that's kind of a subscription trigger that we cr created within the patient. But we could have simply added further to say um, any, any patient who was discharged and had a subscription, uh, had a ICD code diagnosis of this, uh, from this value set or this value set. So you can actually add that expression longer. Now, um, we heard from EHR vendors here that, uh, that um, it may not, the implementation may not go to the level of having an open-ended CQL expression becoming part of a subscription query because that would open up everything. So there could be a restriction in how it's going to be opened up, but uh, that's what the uh, uh, September work group might uh, kind of help us uh, figure out what are some of the areas. Just like in CDS Hook, we have a medication prescribed. We have, um, we have like, what was the other one? Uh, uh, open chart kind of few uh, uh, patient, yeah. Yeah, so those are some existing CDS hooks that are there. So similarly for subscription, we anticipate we might have some very specific ones to be available, so. I'm sorry? So, um, so the response could be a fire message. It could be a fire message, yeah. But in this use case, we just, uh, we were, that, that was not the focus area. We were more interested in getting the trigger knowledge delivered and extract out, so. And, and part of this project also applies to some of the guideline work. So, so in CDC, we are trying to do, it's a multi-agency activity, which we're trying to see is like a, a kind of a, um, um, guidelines for the new digital age. So it's basically trying to translate all our guidelines work into a machine consumable CQL expressions and plan definitions. So this kind of applies to how this might actually be translated into an execution side too, so. Any other questions? All right, if not, we will hope to see you guys at the HL7 work group session in September. Then. All right, hi guys. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about how to Use fire to leverage, um, or to leveraging fire to get to a microservices strategy. So Athena Health has been pretty open about the fact that we're moving to a microservices strategy. Oh yeah, it is pretty tinted. Oh. <laughs> um, and we're in the unique position that we're moving um, from a monolith to microservices, and we've also been cloud-based from the beginning. So we need to keep up um, with our cloud-based traffic when we have a lot of traffic. Um, so we're talking basically about how we can use fire to help us solve these unique problems. So to start out, um, my name is Erin Geilinger. I've been a developer at Athena Health for three years, um, working on the ambulatory EHR product the whole time. Um, I own a really cute dog. Her name's Tabitha. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at A. Geilinger. Hi, my name is Brian Knight. Um, I'm a principal member of technical staff whatever that means. Um, I have about 12 years of development experience. Um, I am a pizza lover. Uh, Frank Pepe's New Haven, best pizza. And you can follow me on Twitter at Brian J. Knight. All right, so we're just gonna quickly go through what is a monolith, what are the pitfalls of monolith, how can microservices help, how can only leverage fire to help us along that path, and how do we move from that monolith to the microservices. To start out, what is a monolith? Basically a monolith is just when you have a single application that's all really bundled together and it's all pretty interconnected and it's just like all your server side logic for a website is just run together, bundled together, pushed into production together. Um, and the problems here is that everything is super tightly coupled. Um, there's not a lot of separation of concerns. Like you can try to separate your concerns, but eventually everything breaks down. Um, it's only as stable as its weakest link. It scales as a unit and the complexity scales as you add more like little boxes of logic, all your little arrows, you keep adding and just like understanding it all can get super complicated. So scaling the monolith also means you need to scale everything. So if a certain part of your application needs a certain amount of CPU, then every machine that you run your application on needs at least that much CPU. And eventually you run out of machines big enough to run 
all these things. They only make machines so big. Um, and then whenever you add new logic, it again adds complexity. Of, like you need to test if you add into thing three, you need to test all of thing one, thing two, and thing five, etc. Uh, and then a unique problem is if you share a database, which most monoliths do, um, if you update the data model at all, then you need to update every single place that reads from that database, which is usually a lot. Um, and then you can only have a single type of database, so you need to have like a relational database when maybe you want a graph database or a NoSQL database. And then stability, uh, any part of the application can bring down any other part of the application. So you can bring down critical workflows through some little thing that doesn't actually mean much. So how do we solve all these problems? We move to microservices. So microservices are basically you split out all the little um, services that are within your application. You own the data within each microservice, and then you communicate as if they're each their own um, application, like with, for example, REST over HTTP. Cool. So I'll talk a little bit more about microservices. Um, show of hands, how many people are using microservices at their place? Cool. So we got a good showing. Uh, so as some of you already know, like microservices allow you to keep things simple. You really focus on one and only one problem. And then you, as and alluded to, you use the data sort that you want to use that best solves your problem. So if you're trying to figure out how things are connected, GraphQL is a great approach. If you're just setting up a website, Cassandra might be a better solution for your data store. And then you also can pick what language you want to use. You can be language agnostic across all the different microservices because, as we'll kind of show, HTTP REST is the traditional way you would approach it. Um, the other thing, too, is with microservices, if one service goes down, you don't bring the entire application down. So like maybe if you had a microservice that did claim processing and that went down, people could still submit uh, you know, clinical information, but you don't bring the entire website down. Yeah. This is the actual EHR itself. So, as, so Athena right now is in a transition of moving away from a large monolith implementation to having specific microservices that solve specific healthcare problems. So one may be like a service that does quality management, another one that does claim processing, another one that stores all your chart information. And so by breaking those out, we can now be able to scale at a much faster pace as well as enable developers to move quicker. Does that answer your question? Gotcha. Okay. okay, so now um, we're in a land where we have microservices, and now every microservice owns its own data, but it still needs data usually from other services, like the chart microservice probably sends a lot of data around. Um, so you need to keep your data in sync and access it through multiple um, different services. And so this really becomes a critical point of you need to understand each other's data um, you, and you need to make sure that the meaning isn't lost between two different services. So you end up in this world where you have all of these separate little services that need data from each other and this might be a familiar problem of uh, in the industry we tend to have different like um, implementers need each other's data, so it's the classic interoperability problem. And so I think we're all bought in here to the solution of that is Fire. So we can use Fire-inspired models to communicate between microservices. Um, and the benefits of if we do this is that we can um, leverage the expertly modeled um, data model. And it's a standard data model, so you don't have to translate between different services all the time. You can leverage open source tools and then hopefully eventually get back to the community. Um, and then you can get classic, more classic interoperability out of the box. You can just set up a fire server and send data to it, have CDS, quality measurement, et cetera. So now that we've decided that we want to get out of the monolith and go to microservices, you have to figure out a strategy how to actually move your stuff out of the monolith and into the microservices. And because we have an EHR, you can't really just shut it down and just move all the data over a weekend and hopefully no one gets sick over the weekend. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So 
we came up with a very overly simplified process. Um, the, your mileage may vary, but this is the strategy that we're going to try to attempt. Is first try to actually get something working. Let's build a microservice that actually does claim processing or quality processing. And then start to figure out how can we start to intercept events that are happening in the monolith and start sending them over into the microservice. And be able to also send events from the microservice back into the monolith so that the two systems can stay in sync. Then over time, figure out how we can reconcile that the data that's in the monolith is now in the microservice and we have uh, validity that we have everything. We don't want to be missing diagnoses, medications, like these are people's health that we're, we're managing. We don't want to lose that information. And then finally start to do that rollout, switch people over such that from a practitioner standpoint, they don't notice anything. Like they just go into work next day and it's the exact same UI. Maybe it's a shinier UI, but for the most part, everything's been migrated onto a new microservice. So as part of that migration, you have to keep the lights on. That's kind of alluded to. And in, Evan, uh, in Eric Evans' book, uh, Domain Driven Design, he talks about a concept called anti the anti-corruption layer. And this is a service that would enable both the monolith and the new microservices to talk to each other. The idea that we're going, or, or, uh, going with is that if the microservices are communicating in fire, we want to be able to send fire messages to this anti-corruption layer that would then be translated into the model that the monolith understands, which might be some Django server, it might be a Perl stack, whatever you built 20 years ago. So what, this is kind of like a very simplified version of it, but by being able to send those models back and forth between the monolith, the monolith is just sending what it already has to this anti-corruption uh, layer. And it's receiving stuff from the microservices as well. So over time, the two should become in, become in sync and with parity. So how do we get the data from this monolith to, say, the anti-corruption layer or to any other kinds of services that exist? Um, there's two major ways that we've looked into is change data capture or just like reading from the database or just putting existing domain entities on, say, a Kafka or a Kinesis queue, which just allows people to publish to it and others to read from it at their own pace. Uh, so the first method is change data capture. So change data capture is just a method of finding and reporting out data changes, be it um, inserts, updates, deletes, et cetera, from your data store. Most major database systems have implemented this already. So you have like log miner for Oracle, SQL Server, CDC, et cetera. Um, but the challenges of if you want to use CDC um, to convert to Fire in our case is that if your tables, your existing tables don't align with Fire concepts, recreating the Fire concept from what you have in the database can be really difficult. Um, so the options here is that you could publish only what has changed into a Fire repo and then just like keep updating that big Fire model until you get a complete picture, but then knowing when you have that complete picture is more difficult. Or you can try to link together the tables um, and recreate the models, but if you have a bad enough database design, this could prove very difficult. Um, and then another challenge of using CDC is that you have to wait until it goes through the database and commits to the database, then goes through CDC, and then you convert it to fire, so you have no options to speed up that process. Um, but then the pros is that it's workflow agnostic. You're going to the source of truth, so you don't need to worry about missing out on any data. Um, and then the second way that you can get data from the monolith is through pushing domain entities onto a queue. Um, so like a Kafka stream, and then once it's on that stream, then you can use ETL on that do existing domain model to convert to fire. Um, and the benefits here is that hopefully your domain entities are closer to fire, at least have more of the data that you need, uh, and you have the ability to get quicker data access, so you can push it up in the workflow and push it onto the queue um, quicker than it saves to the database, for example. But the drawbacks here is that you need to know um, where to intercept the models, so you need to know which workflows to push onto the queue, and then if um, either fails, so pushing to the queue, or the database save fails, then you potentially can get the data out of sync, which is very bad. Like how many districts would there like, like what size would you go to get the library or 
so this is so Athena Health is a cloud based EHR. So what's that? It's multi tenant. So I don't have the numbers, but we're talking orders of millions of people. Yeah. So the stack was actually pretty short. Um, so very, given the fact that there's only 20 minutes to really go into a very complex topic, we, try, we went pretty high level, but hopefully coming out of this, we've kind of discussed monoliths, why they don't scale, microservices, why they do scale, but they have their challenges in terms of being able to communicate and be able to get the data onto, the, onto those new microservices, how fire can be leveraged as a mechanism for sharing knowledge across those different fire, uh, those microservices, and then figuring out how to bring that data from the monolith into, uh, from the monolith into the microservices. So with that, uh, if there are any other questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, Yeah, so, so the question was whether or not we consider using a clinical data repository. Um, to be honest, we didn't, um, but maybe that's something that... In, so in practice, we kind of are using a mix of both. Um, so we're like, we're kind of creating our own data repository and then converting that to fire. And then, but like that doesn't give you enough like real time access. And like if we want our microservices to succeed, we want like to be able to test them real time and be able to use them more real time. So we want to be able to like do both. So in practice, we kind of have both of our repository and this more real time feed. So the question is, what was the biggest challenge we've had since we moved to microservices? I think really is that We've run into a few things. <laughs> um, I think w one is being, having that, that confidence in the data being moved over from the monolith and into the microservices. I think figuring out how you handle failures in that process as well. So like this all works great until that something maybe go down, it goes down in that anti-corruption layer where now we're not getting a feed of changes that are happening in the monolith. So now we get out of sync. How do you get back in sync? Um, anything else? Moving to a DevOps model from like an existing like not DevOps model, so a lot of just like learning new things and getting people on board has been, I don't know, it's a political challenge as well as a technical challenge. Uh, So it depends on the service. The benefit of microservices is that each service can do whatever it needs to do. So like if a service needs the fire model to be like perfectly validated and like perfectly in sync, then it should have its own layer like that. But then some don't need that level of validation, so they just kind of accept the payload and do what they want with it. So it really depends on the service. I mean, if you want to have like each uh, broader understanding, like Fire is like more of the standard of like everybody will understand that. Otherwise, you kind of have to translate like ad hoc. Like, what are you like? Like, like, like the hopefully Fire, yeah. We still also have to support a lot of older formats like HL7v2, CCDAs. Uh, we're still getting. C CSVs, Excel files. So unfortunately, we got a lot of other types of data that we're bringing in, but we're trying to build like an ETL um, layer to try to bring that back down into, hopefully into fire. But it's a very long ongoing process. It's probably going to take a year or two, I think, until we get to like a true state. Uh, yes. That's a great question. So the question is how we're sharing data. Um, right now we are doing two separate data stores. So we are trying to separate both 
we're not using a shared database solution um, because that's how we got into the monolith problem in the first place, is that we were using the database as a canonical source of truth. Um, and because of that, everything was tied to that schema. So as we started breaking out the microservices, we started, each microservice team had its choice of like, what database do you want to use? Do you want to use Mongo? Do you want to use Cassandra? Do you want to use Elasticsearch? Maybe you want to use Elasticsearch on Cassandra. Um, and so they owned how they were going to store the data. All they had to do is be able to start accepting Fire as the mechanism to bring the data in and be able to communicate that data out. That's the goal. Yeah, so the goal is for us to be able to, as right now users are still using the monolith, so as changes are being made to the monolith, we want to be able to connect in and be able to, the, what we want is the monolith to be able to fire events off to that anti-corruption layer so that as it's persisting its model of how it stores an allergy or how it stores a problem, it will send that same model to the anti-corruption layer, which will then be transformed into fire that then the microservices can consume. So I, I'm not really sure exactly what the question is. Could you repeat that? Sorry. <laughs> I see. So the, just to paraphrase to make sure I got it right, the question is, is there, do we see strong value in being able to have those microservices talk back to the monolith? Gotcha. So it's, it's a pretty complex, um, it's pretty complica complicated in the sense that, that some microservice teams are building their own UI widgets. So those are going to be surfaced kind of built into the monolith, and then slowly, as they start to re redo the UI layer, it will probably start moving more things to, such that the UI will be presented, and then it would bring in widgets from the various microservices. Right now, we're just putting in small hooks such that we can at least make a call to the microservices from the monolith. So it's, to be perfectly frank, it's a pretty gnarly ball of yarn that we're trying to untangle. Um, so it's probably going to, I don't have a good answer, to be honest. Yeah, and there's also the problem of like in the monolith, since everything reads from the shared database. Like, there's some workflows that we've even forgotten about that like read from a certain table in the database. That if we stop feeding that database, that workflow will like fall down. And so we just like accounting for every single workflow and like making those all services is a difficult and time-consuming process. Yeah, I mean, so the, I, the question is um, if like having the full fire resource for tasks that might need a smaller subset is a difficult problem, and like the answer is yes. Um, in some microservices, they don't store the full data model, or like, so when they like send the data out of them, they're not able to send that full data model back. Um, but it's really about like knowing what services store what and like being able to understand exactly which services contain what data. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point with um, CICD in the fact that when you have dependencies across the microservices, that w that's when things get really, really hairy. And I think that's going to someone's question. Like, that was something else that we've been really working hard on trying to solving. It's like, how do we ma solve those dependencies such that as I make a change to my microservice, I don't break the entire network because I decided to change my version. Exactly. So, yeah. Phoenix, Phoenix Project all day. Um, I think we are running out of time, so, um, but if people want to swing by, we're happy to chat afterwards. Uh, but thank you so much.